glad for the blood. How many couldn't do without the blood? Cleansing stream. Hallelujah. That precious blood of Jesus. So good to have all of you with us this morning. And we're happy also to have uh, any visitors that may be with us. And just before, there is a couple that we want to recognize this morning uh, that have driven in, a uh, fellow pastor. But before we do, uh, our youth pastor and his wife have been with us a couple weeks now, and we've given them time to sort of get oriented a little bit and find out where the kids are going to sleep and eat and different things like this. And I think we've got all that taken care of. And I'd like to invite Pastor Scott and Becca up to the platform and just introduce them formally to you as our new youth pastor and wife. Fine couple. They have their problems. <laughs> Amen. We're happy to have Brother and Sister McGillis with us and uh, their four children and beautiful, three beautiful boys and a brand new girl. And we're just going to help raise those children. <laughs> can, you, can you say amen? amen? Praise the Lord. And uh, Brother Scott, would you like to say something this morning? Uh, you're welcome to. It's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure coming here and getting into all your youth and different things, and I, I thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You guys have been very, very good to us. You've really made it very easy moving from the promised land of Cleveland, Ohio, to <laughs> Egypt here, but you <laughs> made that transition very, you've made it very, very good for us. And I thank you for all the help that we've been able to, uh, those of you have come and, and done different things for us. I thank you for that. And it's been it's been good. And I look forward to you know doing some things with the youth and hopefully uh, seeing what God will do with them. different things. So thank you. Well, I, I really want to thank you too from the bottom of all of our hearts because even our children, you know, the transition was smooth and you have all really just gone out of your way to make us feel super comfortable. And in fact, a week after we moved here, my sister-in-law was talking to me. I said, I, I don't even really miss anybody at home. <laughs> and Scott said, you should tell people. <laughs> but no, really, we, we just really have enjoyed being here, and we really enjoy getting to know you guys. And I apologize if I call you by a name that isn't yours. <laughs> so I that's okay. But no, thank you very much. I'd like to ask you to stand one more time. We have prayer for this one. We ask the Lord that our, brother, our young brother has a real heart for missions, a real heart for the Word. And we're, we're praying that God is going to just take our youth group into a a deeper place, uh, find some kids in our youth group that are ready to go into the ministry and do some things God wants them to do in the future. And we're just going to pray for them right now. Would you bind your hearts with me? Oh. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you do place people in the ministry. We thank you, Lord, for this young couple to have left and pulled up stakes in their church. They have been six years in Jesus. And left many of their families and Lord have come to a place they know nothing of because they are interested in only one thing, that is to do the will of God and to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, you'll put a double portion of your anointing upon Pastor Scott and his wife. Use them both together in this ministry. And may our kids grow and mature through their leadership and their ministry. Lord Jesus, I just pray you'll supply for them, whether it be monetarily or physically or spiritually, Lord, you'll be there and be the answer to everything they have. May not only they be a blessing to us, 
but may our church and our community likewise be a blessing to them. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give him a big hand. stand first. Uh, that's probably what I should have done up here, too. Uh, Sister Howard, it's good to have you. chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. These are the two scriptures that I will use as my text today. And the Lord has not only confirmed this message, I wonder, you know, uh, you, as a pastor, you get, you get sort of on a, uh, I don't want to say on a roll, but you know sometimes we get the preaching in a certain direction. And we want to continue to do that. All, right in the middle of me preaching on these messages on holiness. How many believe in holiness? Amen. Amen. Serving God and, and being ready for the rapture. But right in the middle of it, the Lord lays, lays this on my heart. And I think maybe, uh, maybe for this reason. You know, the Christian life can be a belaborment to us if we allow it. We can live positively a miserable life as a Christian Amen. if we allow that to happen. It's up to us whether we live miserably or happily. Amen. How many agree? Amen. You say, well, God's my source. Yes, that's my message this morning. But you know, folks, I think we, we depend on God too much for things that we ourselves have a responsibility to do. And God has saved us and He has brought us into a place of worship and fellowship. But by the same token, God wants us to pick up and He wants us to do with what we know. That's right. Now how many agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I believe that's where we're at this morning. So with all these messages that I have preached, many of them quite smoky. <laughs> you'll have to agree Amen. many of you'll not forget for a long time Amen. yet in the midst of these messages there is a contentment that God can give us there is a, a rest to the people of God Amen. how many believe that? Amen. right in the midst of us saying oh God your conviction is heavier upon me than I've ever known God in the midst of that conviction show me your way and also show me your rest Amen. God can give us that. Amen. Philippians chapter 4. I'm sort of preaching on contentment, and I'm coming from a couple directions this morning, so you bear with me. I'm going to follow my notes as closely as possible today. Philippians 4.11, King James Version. 
Not that I speak in respect of what. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. And in the Living Bible, don't often use that version in the pulpit, but in the Living Bible it says it this way. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to get along happily, whether I have much or little. Can you say amen? amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Turn with me back to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30. Boy, this is a powerful scripture. I don't know whether you've ever seen this or not. Very powerful scripture. And I think it brings us right down to where we're at with our message this morning. First of all, before I go any further, oftentimes people have asked me the question, will rich people go to heaven? It seems like the Bible says that it is harder for a rich man, you know, people have quoted this to me, it's harder for a rich, a rich man to go to heaven than it is to go through what? The eye of the needle. Uh, well, this morning, before I get into this message, I want you to know that there's going to be lots of people that are well-to-do in heaven. Amen. There's going to be people that have lots of money or had lots of money Amen. in heaven. You know, when you die, you leave it all. Yes. Not that we hear, maybe some of you do, but I don't know, I shouldn't say most of us, but uh, me, I know that there's not going to be a whole lot to leave. You know, I'm going to leave a few dollars for the wife because I figure she'll still be around when I'm gone. But I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't have said that. I really should have. I repent. But my message this morning, although it may allude in a few cases to, to money, Yet, money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of it. It's making it a God. And that is partly what's wrong with our society. Our society has become very, very humanistic and self-indulgent. And because of it, the church has suffered. And the work of God has suffered. How many can say amen? And there's one other thing that has suffered because of it. Faith. Well, that's enough. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 7. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me any vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor, and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. Amen. Woo! I think that's a powerful scripture. Amen. That's a powerful scripture. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Fanny Jane Crosby said it best. Oh, what a happy soul am I, though I cannot see I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. Amen. How many can say amen? amen? You see, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, too many people never learn this lesson about contentment. Some pessimistically ask, can anyone ever be truly happy here upon planet Earth? Sir, have you ever reached the place? How about you, lady? After just one day when everything has gone wrong and you talk to yourself, how many's ever talked to yourself? <laughs> Again, I was in an elevator. This time I wasn't crazy. And I wasn't humming. Literally, I was talking to myself. 
And, and there was a man standing and he moved. There's only him and me on the elevator this past week. And he moved me. And he was standing across from me and he moved all the way to the end of the elevator. <laughs> and so I realized that I needed to say something to break the whatever. And so I said, sir, I said, have you, have you ever talked to yourself? He said, well, not like you. <laughs> And I told him, I said, I was going to tell you I'm a minister. I said, he said, you're a minister. And he said, you ought to be talking to yourself. <laughs> but have you ever found yourself talking to yourself? Maybe while you were talking to yourself, the words of the psalmist in Psalm 55, verses 6 through 8, came to mind. Oh, that I had wings like a dove. For then would I fly away and be at rest. Lo, then would I wander afar off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and the tempest. In today's language, ladies and gentlemen, we would say, I want to get away from it all. I think there's lots of people today that feel that way. There's lots of people that become exasperated with life. Exasperated with the load, the tension, and the burdens that life bring with it in this age in which we live. You see, the ocean breeze, write this down in your notes, the ocean breeze and the mountain scenery cannot make an unhappy person happy. You know, sometimes we, we make arrangements to go away. Nothing wrong with that. And I apologize for praying for various people that went to the beach this year, that it would rain every day. <laughs> I want to publicly apologize for that. First of all, God didn't answer my prayer. And secondly, I became convicted. I was only kidding. I, I really didn't. <laughs> you see, so many times we arrange to go away to the beach, or we arrange to go to a mountain retreat, thinking that if we can get away, it's going to solve the problem that's in our head or the problem that's in our heart. I want you to know it's not going to solve your problem. The cause and the cure of your problem and my problem go deeper than a travel folder. In fact, before I go any farther, it might be good to read a portion of Scripture to you. In Psalm 139, beginning with verse 7, King James Version. Here's what it says. This is a powerful portion of Scripture. Now, again, don't go home and say, Pastor said it's wrong to take a vacation. I think everybody needs them, and they're good for us. But the fact is, when you come home, I hate to tell you this, you come back to the same problems you left. Am I correct? So it's all, a lot of it is in our frame of mind, in our frame of heart, how we deal with our spirit under the auspices of the power and the guidance of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I believe that. Here's what Psalm 139, verse 7 says. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Just remember this portion of Scripture. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm saying with this scripture is this. I believe after reading this scripture, looking at the fact that what we do necessarily to avoid the situation is not going to bring the answer, the answer is pretty simple. Since none of us can either get away from God, and I hate to tell you this, nor get away from ourselves, there is only one thing left to do. We must learn how to live. How many people today have learned how to live? We think we have. We stagger and we fumble. We sway and we jump. 
jerk about? Avoiding the tremendous things that come in our path? Thinking that we made life a little better because we avoided that issue. And when we get past it, we say under our breath, I feel sorry for the next person behind me. They may not miss it. But ladies and gentlemen, we can't walk through life avoiding issues. We can't run from ourselves. And I would say this unto you this morning, 99% of all our problems is ourself. We cannot blame it on something else or somebody else. You are where you are because you put yourself there. I'm going to say, Amen. this isn't real popular, but I'm telling you, it's the truth. I believe the Lord and the Holy Ghost and even the devil, as much as I hate him. Even the devil gets blamed for stuff that he oughtn't to get blamed for. How many? Maybe you don't want to say amen to that. But I, I'll tell you, folks, it's the truth. You know, we can make a cop out in our lives and say because of this or because of this I'm staggering about. There is no reason why anybody staggers unless they themselves allow it. Amen. It's time we stand up and take hold of our collar and say, Fred Tom, I'll say Fred Tomlinson. <laughs> Fred Tomlinson, start acting like a Christian. Start acting like a man. Get your eyes off the things and people and other things. You know, as soon as we get in victory for Jesus, somebody comes along. <laughs> <laughs> I was never wanted you to know this. <laughs> this is my kind of time. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> Don't tell me that anymore. Don't tell me that anymore. My prompter is with us this morning. She helps me so much. Fred Tomlinson, get yourself under control. <laughs> You know, God jerked me about. I think it's time we jerk ourselves about. <coughs> and I'm right for it. Yeah. I don't say that everything we do, I think that'd be very humanistic. But I think there's things we can do. There's things we can do to make ourselves a far better man and woman than we are now. God's given us that ability. How many believe that? God's given us those that gift of decision making. To where we can make positive decisions or negative decisions in our lives. And either one can make a big, big effect on our lifestyle. On our happiness. Or our unhappiness. I think my happiness is not contingent today upon my surroundings. Although sometimes that happiness is affected by my environment. Yet I must keep my eyes on the Master. This morning I need to learn how to live. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, God wants man to be happy. Now, you must listen closely to me. I believe a Christian is a happy person. Now, that's superficial. So I need to go a little deeper than that. I think I know Christians. When they come to church, they got this real pretty smile on their face. <laughs> and you would think that everything is hunky dory. That's a West Virginia term, if you ever heard one. <laughs> everything is fine with them. You never know what's going on in their heart when they walk into church. They just got a, a broad smile. But as soon as they step in the door of their home, all that so called joy is gone. And they become a different person, a different individual than they were at church. I'm not talking about that kind of happiness. I'm talking about happiness that exists in the heart of men. It may not always show. You see, whether you want to admit this or not, I'm not human. 
Uh, oh, I am you. Yeah. I, I'm, 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 what was I? I'm still you. You say, Pastor, maybe I'm guilty of this. You know, there's times in my ministry when I've wanted to lay my hand across another Christian's face. Hey, I hope I'm not alone or I am in bad trouble. There's times when I've become aggravated with other believers. And I'm the preacher. But I had to, you know, I had to cool it and, and, and try to be the preacher. And be nice. You see, but if I walk around all my life doing that and live aggravation, then I'm going to be a very miserable individual. That's right. yeah. Somewhere along the line, my happiness has to come from inside. Amen. And it's got to start coming out. As much and as human as I am, and the mistakes that I make with frustrations and things like that. Yet, I can say honestly in my heart, the only thing that keeps me going in this world today is the happiness that God has put in my Amen. Amen. Because when everything around me seems to fall apart, I still got, got that light burning. How many can say amen? amen. Well, I got that light burning down deep inside. You remember back in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, the Bible seems to say Israel was in bad shape. Why was she in bad shape? Because the Bible says the light went out in the temple. Amen. And I believe that could be attributed to us today. This body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I believe, I taught on it last Wednesday night, if you remember, uh, pointing toward that last day thing. Because this body is a temple, the soul becomes the light. That soul can only be lit, lit as I allow Jesus Christ to dominate it. If I allow everything around me to dominate my life, I become a confused individual. One time, I'm this way. The next time, I'm that way. The next time, I'm another way. And pretty soon, not only do I know, don't know where I'm at, but other people don't know how to take me. And they begin to pull away from me because they don't know what I'm going to do next. all goes back to the core of happiness. Contentment. Listen. Your surroundings may attack your happiness, but those circumstances cannot destroy it. Thank God. Happiness is something that is inside you. Sing it with me this morning. What a fellowship. What a joy change. 
Money cannot buy. And, and I'm saying that not frivolously. I mean, there are people in life that think that they can pay their way through and get whatever they want from God or anything else. But that doesn't work. I believe your personal contentment comes from facing life as it is. Stop ignoring it. Stop play acting. Stop pretending. Life is bigger than you are. Admit it. Amen. Amen. I never heard that before. We heard it now. Life is bigger than you are. Bigger than me. Let's admit it. I believe that God never meant for us to fight it. How are you going to face it? Are you going to beat your head against the wall of reality and curse the day you were born? Are you going to sit under some juniper tree and whine for extinction? Are you going to fold up because you find yourself with only one talent and your neighbor may have five? Folks, we need to get ourselves together. Helen Keller, C.M. Ward, in one of his writings, and I copied this down, wrote, Helen Keller found herself blind and deaf from in infancy, yet she lived the more abundant life. Helen didn't have much to start out with, but she didn't get angry with life. She accepted facts and adjusted herself to them. Happiness was the dividend of that adjustment. Somebody has said, I believe there is a measure of truth in it. If you cannot do what you like, listen to this, write it down. If you cannot do what you like, then you must like what you can do. Somewhere in life, we've got to get our wits together. We've got to get our heart together. We've got to be a vessel that God can use. And if we're all fragmented and all distorted and all torn apart with life, God can't use us. He just can't use us. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to what Paul says in my, in, in my text this morning in Philippians chapter 4. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you say that? All things through Christ. This is a man, ladies and gentlemen, who learned to say, most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches. You listen to this. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I need to take a lesson from this. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. How long has it been, Fred Tomlinson, since you have enjoyed an infirmity? <laughs> since you praise God for it, Paul says to do it. Am I right? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You see, I know the attitude the Master took toward life. I find it in his prayer in the garden when he said, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Listen. Brothers and sisters, this morning when a man prays that prayer, he's equal to any situation. I believe it. Any situation. I know that faith in God will lead me to accept as a fact. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for you. To them who know God. All things work together. May not look good. May not seem good. All things work together for you. Number two. Not only for contentment must I face life as it is, but secondly, I must live with eternity in view. I must learn as a believer how to live with eternity in view. I still believe, folks, the, the verse that I, I live by this. I quote this scripture in hospitals, beside, and you know, I've had people rebuke me for this. I've had preachers rebuke me for this. Preachers say, you shouldn't 
You shouldn't contest somebody's sin. Like a lady told me a couple years ago, not a couple, about, I've been here 20 years, so it's been 25, 24 years. But I remember it vividly. A lady walked up to me and said, Oh, praise God, praise God, praise God, I'm so happy this morning. Hallelujah! She was glory and praise of the Lord. And I said, Sister, what's God into? You're usually not like this. Let that soak in a minute. She said, I just know my husband's saved. I've confessed it. I mean, he's in the bar drinking this morning. But I just know he's saved. I said, sister, you know, I'm going to be the last person to bust your bubble. <laughs> and I said, you've got to face reality. The husband needs to get out of the bar. He needs to quit drinking. And he needs to come to church. And he needs to confess to God his sin. He needs the blood to cover his sins. And he needs to repent. And I said, sister, I believe we can ask God to save him. But I said, sister, don't walk around telling people he's saved when you and I both know he's not. I said, we need to be careful what we confess. I believe we can put our needs before God and say, God, I leave them there, and I believe you will meet the need. How many believe? Amen. You will meet the need. But you know, we need to be very careful. I believe, though, there are times when we confess sickness, eventually we'll get sick. Yeah. You know, you think you're sick long enough. Oh, man, I feel bad. Yeah. You, know, you tell yourself that 15 times a day for about 20 days and you'll feel bad. <laughs> Nobody will have to give you a need or nothing. You'll feel bad. <laughs> How do you believe that? Yeah. We must live with eternity in view. I still believe, I say this because I, even though I've been rebuked for it, all things, here's somebody laying in bed and they're suffering. I kneel down beside them and pray. I believe all things work together for good to them who love God. Know that that person is a Christian. And I've been rebuked for that. But I'll tell you something, folks. I live by that scripture. I live by it. If I did not live by it, then I could not make it through tomorrow. Amen. Too many today, sit tight. Listen to me closely. I believe today, if we're going to live with eternity in view, we must remember that too many love houses and real estate, gardens and gimmicks, futures and careers. And we are always frightened that we will, those things will be taken away from us. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced that life depends on what you love, not simply on breathing and drawing a paycheck. Is that too strong? It's true. Until I've learned to love Jesus, until I've learned to live in Him. I can't do enough in this life to compensate for my unrest and my pain. Again, I've been reading some of C.M. Moore's writings. It goes on to say, it does not matter whether a man's dearest treasure in life is sensual pleasure, athletic pursuit, a desire for fame, a beautiful home, a bank account, or simply selfish control of his family. All alike lead to unhappiness. Perhaps more homes are broken up, ladies and gentlemen, over arguments about money today than anything else. Think what happens every week in this world. Gambling. Dishonesty. Misunderstanding. Jealousy. Anger, hate, and heartbreak are just some of the byproducts of a life given over to materialism. And you might look at me and say, well, Pastor, it's easy for you to say you don't have nothing. I do have things. But, you know, I, don't, I used to have a home. I don't have one now. The church provides one for me. I'm very happy. Very happy. <coughs> And maybe it is easier for me to say that. I don't know. But I know one thing down the road. If this church and my ministry and my work for God isn't more important to me than faith, then I'll lose my ministry. 
How many agree? Yes. I'll lose my ministry. God has to come first. God has to come first, and He's not coming first. Is that too harsh? No. No. God must come first. Family must come second. Yes. And then everything else third. You got to get that in your mind. You got to get that in your heart. God must come first. Every day of my life has got to start out with pleasing God. If I don't do that, I'm going to be an unhappy kid. When General Ruth, founder of the Salvation Army, went blind, his son Branwell broke the news to him. Dad, you're going blind. You mean, responded the general, that I am I'm going blind? Yes, I fear that we must contemplate that, said his son. Booth took his son by the hand, and he said these words to him. Son, I've done what I could for God and for people with my eyes. Now I shall do what I can for God and people without my eyes. Amen. You know what that says to me, ladies and gentlemen? It says, sir, a life like that can never be unhappy. Yes, that's right. A life like that can never be unhappy. I close. Number three. I mean, I'm not closing, but this will help me close. <laughs> Number three. To be content. Not only, first of all, must I face life as it is. Secondly, I must live with eternity in view. Thirdly, to be content, I must try to make other people happy. You want to get happy? Make other people happy. It works. It really does. How long has it been since you or I sacrificed some sleep and sat with a sick friend? Not a relative. Just somebody that was sick in the gun. How long has it been since we took out to dinner a friend who could not return the favor? How long has it been since we really sacrificed for our church? I believe the world is pretty well made up of two classes of people. I want you to write them down. First of all, James McIntosh said these words. It is right to be content with what we have, never with what we are. There are two types or classes of people today. Number one, there's the leaners, and there's the lifters. The leaners consume happiness. The lifters produce it. Let me say it again to you so you can write it down. The leaners consume everybody else's happiness. The lifters help produce it. When we came to church today, did we brighten somebody's corner? Did we make a brother or a sister feel better because we were there? I think that should happen. We're Christians folks. We're not big for hell. We're not out here uh, unsaved. We're, we're part of the family of God. There ought to be some happiness in our spirit. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, and I am winding this up. Here's what, here's what Paul said to the church of Philippi. Verses, four, uh, verses 5 through 7. Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant who was made in the likeness of men. This morning, my question is to us. Are we serious about wanting to be happy? 
Now, I don't, I don't want to be judgmental, but I've got to believe in a crowd this size. There's somebody here not happy. <laughs> I mean, if everybody in this place is happy, <laughs> what am I trying to think of say? If everybody is just bubbling over <laughs> with the happiness of God, Somebody ought to be affected. <laughs> Look at your neighbor for a moment. Look at him closely. <laughs> Not your wife. That's another story. <laughs> Now ask yourself this question. Ask yourself this question. Do they, do they seem happier since I set this up? <laughs> I say this in general sense. So do we want them to be as morbid as we are? <laughs> How many believe the church ought to be a happy place? Yeah. It ought to be a place where people, I've heard too many people say that. When I walk into the church pastor, it's a, it's a haven today. It's a place where I feel like I'm sheltered. It's a place where other people feel like I feel and love like I love and believe like I believe. It's a place where I love to come. I believe it's because of happiness. You see, Unhappy people have all but wrecked our world today. God alone can bring you and I true happiness and contentment. He's been waiting all this time, do you believe it? By Jesus. He's been waiting since the cross to make you and I happy. He's been waiting all this time to make your life happy instead of heavy. Peaceful instead of panicky. Humble instead of haughty. Come to Him now. Admit to Him, Jesus, I'm not a happy person. I try to be the best person I can, but inside, there's a craving in my spirit for the joy of God. If you're here this morning, I'm just going to ask you to just be bold. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. I'm just going to ask you if you're here to step out of your seat right now. Meet me right here and say, Pastor, I want to leave some things on this altar because I want God's joy to be in my spirit. <coughs> wait just a moment. God's got to do it for you. He's got to show you and speak to you in the sun. He's got to say it. I'm going to wait just a moment. Okay. Anyone else? Don't be ashamed to walk up. Folks, it would be so sad to walk out of this church as a sad individual because of the trials and the burdens of this world and not say, Jesus, I need you. I need to lay some things on this old-fashioned order so that your happiness can be concealed in my heart. I'm going to wait just a moment. You know if God's saying, come on, come on, I want you to lay it up there. I want you to lay it up there. I don't want you to leave until you've laid it down. Is there anyone else? Spirit still speaking. Sometimes it takes a few moments for the Spirit to tell us. Just obey Him. Don't come for me. Come because Jesus has invited you. He'll give you a victory. He'll take you through the heart of Jesus. 
He'll help you to be able to understand why you've been feeling the way you feel. What you need to do to see it correct. One more moment. My last call this morning, and I think I will be messing up and not, and not make this offer to the Lord. Is there someone here this morning who say, Pastor, I've never known Christ as my personal Savior. I've never confessed Him as my God. I want to I want to know that I'm born again. Would you raise your hand and say pray? I want to know I'm born again. At this point I don't know. Somebody asked me right now, I couldn't answer. Because I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to stay. I'm going to go about in just a moment and pray for these folks. Maybe there's somebody who would like to come and pray for one of these individuals. I think it would be very important for somebody to stand with these folks. Let them know that they're so 